Thank you, thank you all for being Thanks for the philosophy club, the Axel Club for, for having. We're gonna go kind of so fast because we lost some time with technicalities. Um, oh, look at you. I actually, uh, you actually have extra time then, I told Okay, good. <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to talk about my belief is that you have to have a philosophy, whether it's a personal philosophy or a chiropractic philosophy, because otherwise, how do you know where you're going? So you have to have a direction. So the philosophy is what you need to kind of drive you to becoming over the person that you want to become. And trust me when I say that it's an evolution. Because I'm, I'm 27 years old, and I've been doing this for a, long, for a while now. And you're yeah, no. 27. I'm 26. So I'm 47. I look like shit for 30 years. <laughs> um, so, so the philosophy is important to have. But what is equally important, and maybe if not even more important, is how do you communicate? And so you have to be able to, to verbalize that so the person with whom you're interacting gets it. And so I want to show an example of a guy communicating philosophy. I hope you can see this. And we'll discuss this. I put it this way that for me, philosophy is fundamentally about uh, our finite situation. I mean, can define that in terms of beings toward death. Fellows, two legged linguistically conscious creatures formed between the earth and feces, whose body will one day be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. That's us. The beings toward death. At the same time, we have desire. Why we are organisms in space and time, and so it's desire in the face of death. And then, of course, you've got dogmatism, various attempts to hold on to certainty, various forms of idolatry. And you've got dialogue in the face of dogmatism. And then, of course, structurally and institutionally, you have domination. And you have democracy. You have attempts of people trying to render accountable elites, kings, queens, suzerains, corporate elites, politicians, trying to make these elites accountable to everyday people. So philosophy itself becomes a critical disposition of wrestling with desire in the face of death, wrestling with dialogue of dogmatism and wrestling with democracy, trying to keep alive very fragile democratic experiments in the face of structures of domination, patriarchy, white supremacy, imperial power, uh, uh, state power, all those concentrated forms of power that are not accountable to people who are affected by it. So, what the fuck did you <laughs> <laughs> Democracy. Did you guys get that? He, he must be important because he's in the backseat of a car being filmed. So he must be. But is this how you communicate? Is this how we communicate? And I, I, I guarantee you there are people in our profession who do that, who communicate with these words that for them fulfills a purpose for us as communicators of what we do to the people that we're intended to serve. You've got to ask yourself what's going on. So philosophy is absolutely important, and how you communicate it is equally important. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the same with chiropractic philosophy? Where do we go for this? How do you know where to go? So if I asked you, um, as a Christian, where would you go if you're a Christian to find out about what it is that you think, feel, and say? The Bible. Or if you were a Jew, where would you go? The Torah. Um, or if you were a medical physiologist, where would you go? Right. right? Or if you were um, a carpenter, you might go to some carpenter book. And so where should we go? What's happening, my brother? Hey. So where would you go? Where would you go if you wanted to find out about chiropractic philosophy? Is there a place that we can go? And the answer is, yes, there is a place. In fact, it's called the chiropractic textbook. Now, how many of you, raise your hand in your heads, don't have this book? If you don't have it in your head, don't show us what you're doing. <laughs> I okay. missed that part. That's all right. I miss a lot, too, because it's senility at my point. But this book is actually vital. This is the vital book for you guys to be chiropractors. It's, as, it's that important to medical results as guidance. It's as important to a, a, a rabbi as a Torah. So for us, if we don't have this book, now would be a good time to go, not, I mean not now, but after we're done, it would be a good time to go buy it and begin to learn what's in it because Quite frankly, if you don't know this, then you don't know a whole lot about chiropractic philosophy. This was written in 1927. Actually, it's not true. This was published in 1927 by Ralph Stevens. That's a long time ago. It was probably written many years before that.
But some things, Ulysses, some things, <laughs> some things haven't changed, and the philosophy that we're built upon is very sound. It's immovable. Now, the science that you might find in this book has, has become more modernized, and we understand it because we're better able to, to measure things, but the philosophy is absolutely vital. So if you haven't gotten this book yet, and I, the most amazing thing about this book is that the first few pages, you'll be blown away because there's so much information. There's a certain group uh, in the Bay Area that's actually going through this book page by page, actually line by line, page by page, chapter by chapter, and we're gonna go through this and study it intensively because it's our desire to become masters of chiropractic. And mastery comes from studying and learning from other people who know more than you and repetition. And so our hope is that if you haven't learned about the underground, you might join us at some point next year when it starts again. But it's a, it's, an, it's a group of people who get together on a monthly basis and we study this because we have desire. So if we open the book, there is so much to, to learn and read about. In fact, you ask yourself, well, what is chiropractic philosophy? Well, if you don't know, where would you go? How about the book? So you go to the book, and guess what it says? It tells you right here, chiropractic philosophy. So if you were to read it, it says, it is the explanation of chiropractic. I kind of like to know about chiropractic. It explains the why of everything chiropractic. I'd like to know more about the why. The explanation of cause and effect. It embraces the chiropractic view of all studies concerning in science. That little paragraph sets you up for maybe wanting to nibble on this book a little bit. Because I know that when I read this book, and I've read this book several times, I learn something new almost every time I open a page. Because it's just packed full of information. In fact, if we go on, it says, while chiropractic philosophy is but one of the infinite number of philosophies and of one special science, it should be kept in mind that it is enough for a lifetime study. Even D.D. Palmer, in fact, I was talking to, uh, to Kelly about this, D.D. Palmer even said, study the principles, and in time, you may begin to understand the philosophy. This is coming from D.D. So you've got to study the principles, and we have 33 principles. Now, I don't doubt that you people know that in all these campuses of 33 principles, but there are other campuses in the Bay Area that don't know there's 33 principles. In fact, there are other that never even knew this book was around. In fact, I can't speak there anymore because I spoke about the contents of this book and you didn't want to hear it. But we have, to our availability, a lot of information about chiropractic philosophy. It goes on. It's enough for a lifetime of study. Chiropractic is a radical science. Who doesn't want to be involved in something radical? I know I do. I love stirring shit up whenever possible. So when a book tells me from 1927 it's a radical science, my ears go up. My hairline goes down with my ears going. I'm excited about this. And here's what's great. It says, it is not always understood by those who practice it, and many of these persons doubt because of the misunderstanding. So what's the best way to, to take care of misunderstandings? Educate yourself. Study. Get with people who know. Study. So this is a book that Steve has to wrote. Now that's pretty cool. So he's an old time firefighter from way back then. But how do we know that what he's written here is valid? How can we justify reading this book? Well, let's do this. Also in this book, this is great. Again, if you open the book, you'll see all kinds of great things. If you open the book, there's a section that says, Dr. Palmer, that would be BJ, Dr. Palmer's letter of approval of chiropractic textbooks. So now we have validation that what has been written in this is accepted by the man himself, our developer. So right away, we've got some credibility, do we not? So given we have credibility from people who have preceded us, it might be a good idea for us to learn a little bit more about what's in this. And it says, this is what BJ says about this book. Of all the books written and compiled on chiropractic philosophy, this is by far the best, not excepting my own. A little bit of humility in there, that's all right. The one great, grand, and glorious thing you have done has been to compile many textbooks which are in my writings into a systematic, organized manner, building them up from simple to higher forms, so that any layman inclined to investigate and find out what chiropractic is, is not, what it does and does not, how and why it does what it does. You have clearly, carefully, and consistently compiled the many principles of chiropractic into a readable, understandable book, simple enough, E-N-U-F, for the layman, deep enough for the servant. Oh. Yeah. 
So far, we've got a lot of credibility there. Now it says, your work can now be used as a handbook. So a handbook is that book which allows us to go to it when we have questions. I think we have proven that this is a very important book for us to have, to study, to master with time. It will take time. So who is this chiropractic philosophy for? It's for chiropractic school. Is it for the patients that we serve? Absolutely. It is, but we, this is our language. This is our language. If we start talking to people about the stuff in here, the public, they're going to look like that here. Nuts. And that's okay. But this is for us to have. This is for us to be guided by. And then we are supposed to take this and then talk to people in the language that they understand. How many people have heard this big expression, you just got to tell the story? Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. What that was the story that we're supposed to tell? Mm -hmm. Well, I got an idea for it. If we look on page 63 of this book, it says the story. How about we tell this story? It's already there for us. Now, of course, this is the story of the normal cycle, which if you don't know about, you will learn, I hope, about before you leave here. But the normal complete cycle is something that we really don't want to be talking about either, except that if we dissect out the importance and the relevance of the normal complete cycle, we can tell a pretty nice story about how people live their lives. So the 33 principles that we know about, what are those all about, actually? Life. Here's what I find fascinating. Now, we know that, that a lot of these early chiropractors were Masons, right? And they have this numerology thing, which is kind of interesting. So guess what page in this book is the first page that we talk about the signs of life? Page 33. Yeah, this where is my hair. Not on my head, but on my arm. <laughs> Shut up, Dan. <laughs> you gotta tell a story, right? So what's the story? Well, you guys, your story has to be your story that you're comfortable telling that does not violate the principles of chiropractic. And so in my practice, we talk about life a lot. And we talk about the 33 principles indirectly because it's important for them to know why they're in my office. So that comes from reading this book. And what does chiropractic philosophy do? Well, it gives us a rational foundation it allows us to develop core values, and it's our moral compass. Now, why is that important? It's important because this gives us certainty. See, when you are immovable, when you are irrefutable, when you know what's in this book to the point that you should, then you have certainty. And why is certainty important for chiropractors? Yeah, you want to go for Nick? <laughs> so what certainly comes a certain mindset. And mindset is what directs you. Mindset is what makes you do what you do for the people that you're supposed to serve. It's knowing that you know. Because when you have a certain mindset, you have thoughts, which results in actions, which then give us results. And so when you know what you know so well, almost any situation can come into your office and you can take care of it. Regardless of the stress that you might be under, regardless of the situation that might be facing you. Dr. Don Hart, you've been practicing for how long? 100 years. 100 years or more. <laughs> He's a liar. He's 105 years. A long time. And I'm sure he has seen things in his life that would shake many of us because we don't have experience. And the foundation is built upon when you learn and learn and learn. And so knowing what you know is highly, highly, highly important if you're going to be an effective chiropractor. Because people will come to you for help in their lives. And our job is to make their lives better to the degree that we can, honoring the unbelievable wisdom of the body. Does that make sense? This is not certainty. <laughs> Rubbing people's feet is not, is not chiropractic certainty. It may feel good to the people on the other side of the hands, but this is not what we do. But some chiropractors are a little bit confused, and they actually do this in their offices. It's not for me to judge and say right or wrong. It's just it's not the book. Right? If you look at the book, so one thing that Sean Dill, I don't know if you guys all know who Sean Dill is, but one of the things he, he has is an expression. If you have a question, see if it passes through the book. If it doesn't pass through the book, then it's probably not chiropractic. Does it mean you shouldn't do it? You decide that. But if you have a question, check the book. So you can be certain about what you do. So I'd like to tell you two stories that I love to tell. And you may have heard these if you did have. Um, forgive me for being repetitious. But these are stories that, that um, mean a lot to me because of certainty, which allowed me to respond in these different situations. The first of which is this kid called Evan. This is my son. He'll be five on uh, next Sunday. 
uh, next Thursday, excuse me. So that's me. And that's him. The apple does not fall far from the tree. So we're actually going to be doing a maternity test to see who the mom is in this case, because we know we know the dad. <laughs> right. So Evan, Evan is, for those of you who know him, he's the most incredible kid on the planet, of course, because it's mine. But his, his being here is an incredible story, so I'll tell you about that story. So my wife is a rocket scientist. For, honestly, she really is. Uh, she works at NASA. But when she was getting her master's in, in uh, space engineering, she was in Strasbourg, France. And she was pregnant with, with Evan. So she was there. I was here. And, and we communicated via Skype and, and, and text and all the things that we do. And she says, says to me, I think that I'd like to do a home birth. And I'm thinking, that's a really stupid idea. It's OK. It's your body. What do you want? The last thing you do is you argue with a pregnant woman. So <laughs> no, no, I, I love home births. In fact, I think all of us should be uh, born at home. But, but she wanted to do it, and I said, great, let's do this. And so she started looking on her side of the world for a midwife in our area, and I did the same thing. We came up with the same midwife, which was fantastic. So Rosanna Davis was fantastic. We met her. When Aaron came back to the States, we started attending the classes, and we learned all about what it was going to take to be a home delivery. And we're excited. We're really excited. And um, they give you these huge, like, tanks that you sit in, where the, the woman will sit in as, as she undergoes her labor to, to facilitate the labor. And so we had all this stuff, and, and Evan was due on August 11th. So we're excited. On July 30th, we're at the vets, and Aaron says to me, my water broke. And I said, you know, you, you pee a little bit, right? There's nothing. And she says, my water broke. So as a man, and you guys who have not had kids yet will know, this is when you start to panic regardless of how much you saw, how certain you are. So I said, okay, well, what do we do? She says, well, call Rosanna. And she's calm as can be, and she's taking care of the dog, and I'm starting to freak out. So I call Rosanna, I said, Rosanna, the water broke. And she says, that's fantastic. I said, I know, but what do we do? She says, go home. <laughs> right, go home, get ready. So I said, okay, well, we're gonna go home. So we get home, and Aaron is really starting to progress, and you can tell they progress by the sound of the groans that come out of the bodies. And so she's starting to moan and groan, and, and so I remember, okay, we're gonna get her, get her in this, get her set up, but we had not set up our tub because we thought we had 11 more days to go. So, but fortunately we had a big um, jacuzzi tub in our bathroom downstairs, so I filled it up and I get it ready for her. And she gets in and she's, you know, contracting and, and she's doing well. Um, but it, she wasn't feeling very comfortable, so we got her back out, we got her on the floor, we got her on the bed, and, and she's really making a lot of noise, so I'm thinking she's really, this is getting close, and I don't want to deliver this kid because I have no idea what I'm doing. But I want someone who knows what to do because this is my kid, I want this kid to be okay. So it's 9.30, and I call Rosanna, and I said, like, you know, where the hell are you? It's been four hours since I called her. She says, we're just finished up here. We'll be there really shortly. Well, a few minutes later, they show up. So it's Rosanna, and there are three of her midwives. They come in, and she does an exam, and she says, Aaron is, like, dilated. She's ready to go. So we're going to go ahead and get ready. And so they set the tub up for us, which was really nice. And uh, we start the process, and so she gets in the tub, and she gets out, and we have her up downstairs, and, and she's dilated, but the baby's just not coming out. So she says, I want you to get in the tub with her. And I said, why do I want to get in the tub with my wife? She said, you need to help her facilitate the pushing. So I did that. And I pushed maybe three times. And I had said, I need to go to the hospital because I'm exhausted. I don't know how you women do this. And so you guys are amazing. <laughs> Nonetheless, while in the, bath, in the tub, um, she says, oh, the baby has passed his first bowel movement pony. We, we have to go. We have to go to the hospital. Because this can be a very dangerous situation. So we call the ambulance and we get transported to the hospital. Unfortunately, they had a midwife on staff at, at Kaiser when we got there. So Rosanna exchanged information with the midwife. It was a nice exchange. The midwife says, I know you guys want to do this really naturally. We want to, we want to honor that. But would you mind if we, if we monitor the baby for fetal distress? I said, whatever you need to do is OK. So they, they put this thing in the baby's head, and it monitors the stress. And she says, this baby is in great distress. And so we're going to call in our emergency pediatrician and his staff, and we'll get ready when this, when this thing happens. What had happened is that, although she was fully dilated, part of her service had caught his head. So every time he came out, the service would push him back in. And he had been doing this for about six hours. And then he passed the meconium, so he had aspirated the meconium. And that's not a good situation. So he was under distress. And finally, the baby came out. So Evan comes out. Now, I had been there for my daughter's birth, so I know what a normal kind of delivery looks like. He came out, and he was white as white. He had yellow eyes. He's got these beautiful blue eyes now, blue green eyes. It's kind of yellow eyes, limp, like just no motion, no life at all to him. 
and they immediately you know, cut the umbilical cord and the emergency pediatrician whisked them off the table and started doing work. And Erin had no idea what was going on. And so I made sure she was okay. So I said, I'm going to go check on the baby. I'll be right back. So I went to go check on the baby and I said to the doctor, I said, you know, tell me what's, this, what's going on. Give me to me straight. And he said, we don't know. He said, these things can go really, really badly and he could pass or he could be here for several weeks. We just don't know. We have to monitor and see what's going to go happen. And we're going to take him upstairs and start our work with him and we'll call you when he's ready to be seen. I said, but before you do, could you just allow me to bring him over to my wife so she could hold him for a second? She has not even held him yet. And we don't know if he's ever going to hold me again. So I bring him over and I'm thinking, he was stuck for six hours doing this. What does a surgical spine do? What can I do? I'm a chiropractor. I'm trained to check these things. So I bring him over to Aaron and I said, Aaron, hold him for a second. So she held him and I palpated his neck. And it felt to me like his atlas was somewhere in Omaha, Nebraska. It was, it was way out. To the degree that I could, I set with certainty an adjustment on that baby. Took him, gave him back to the doctor. He went upstairs and said, we'll call you when it's ready. So we, I went with Aaron. He said, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry. We're going to go upstairs and get you settled in. So we go upstairs and get settled in. And as soon as she's settled in, I'm in the neonatal ICU. I don't want to know what's going on with my kid. So I fly out of the room, I walk into the needle I see, which is a very restricted area, it's supposed to be gowned up. I walk right in, and I look across the room, and there's the doctor and his nurses standing in front of the bassinet, not doing anything. And I'm thinking, he died. So I said, Doc, what, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. He says, we don't know what's going on, but his APGAR score is 9 plus. He's completely breathing on his own. He's got muscle turgidity. He's completely fine. He can hear. So I grab that kid like a thief in the night. I grab that kid, and as I'm walking back into the room to go see Aaron, I'm thinking to myself, what if the only reason I was put on this planet in chiropractic school was to deliver that one adjustment? $150,000. Worth every fucking penny. I kid. This kid's remarkable. To this day, he remains remarkable. He's almost five. At one year of age, because he had this, for, you know, boys don't talk very really much with his babies, but he had this verbalizing ability. And it just so happens how synchronicity happens that Aaron, my wife, had been reading the newspaper, and there's a Stanford study about children who are speaking early. And who wants to know their kids? So she says, would you mind if we enrolled them? I said, of course, I'll listen to So they enrolled him, and they do some tests, and they test for vocabulary and retention. And then one year old, you really can't do a whole lot. But they said, it looks like he might have um, some advanced skills, but once you bring her back before he turns three, and we'll know for sure. So one week before his third birthday, which is about uh, now, two years ago, Aaron brought him in, and they tested him. So he was about an eight to ten minute test. He was there for 45 minutes. He had tested through vocabulary retention all the way through an 11 year old skin. He failed 12 year olds, so he's kind of a loser. <laughs> but 100%, 100% on vocabulary retention for an 11-year-old. Now, here's a kid whose life started out a little bit uncertain. He's never been vaccinated. He's never had a medication in his life. He's had a whole bunch of love. And we feed him pretty good food. He loves ice cream, so that's his only downfall now. But, but I knew with certainty when I had that child in my hand what I was going to do with him. Because I'm a chiropractor. And I was grounded back then, even then, in knowing what I know so I could do what I do. How many of us are grounded? Oh, he must have that ability. So here he is now. This is what he looks like now. He's a goofball. He's gorgeous. He's funny. He's a lover of life. He, if you if you meet him once, you're gonna fall in love with him. You can't have him unless you want to babysit. Let him go to a movie or something. Like <laughs> but this kid rocks. He rocks, and he's had a life of absolute clarity because he gets checked every Wednesday at one o'clock in my office. He and my wife come by every Wednesday, rain or shine, and they get checked. And adjust it when necessary. So we want to make sure that he has what none of us didn't have, and that's an opportunity to be clear from the time that you're born until you take the last breath of air. That's an obligation that we have as chiropractors to do that, to make sure we're checking people regularly based on their lifestyle and their needs for clearance for the nervous system. The second story I want to tell you is a story about Angel. Have you guys heard about Angel? Anybody? So it's a Friday afternoon, March 22nd, 2012. I get a phone call. I'm on my way to Los Angeles to speak at a conference. I get a phone call, a voicemail, from a guy named Angel. Angel is a guy that I had seen 10 years before, and I had not seen him for 10 years. And I get this voice message, and it sounds really broken. It was really hard to understand, and it wasn't because of the connection. Well, it was his connection, not because 
the connection to the phone. And he said, Dr. Jack, this is Angel. I think I've dislocated my hip. I want to see you. So I call him back. And I said, Angel, I'm on my way to the airport. Um, I can't see you, but if you really have dislocated your hip, first of all, I'm probably not the guy you should see anyway. But there's a chiropractor that I know who does really great with extremities. Go see him. He says, no, I want to see you. Now, this conversation that we have is really weird because it doesn't sound like the angel that I know. It's really broken language. It's a lot of delays, a lot of searching for words. So I think this is kind of weird. He says, no, I want to wait and see you. I said, I'll be back in the office on Monday. Come in as soon as you can. On Monday morning, we'll just take you. So Monday morning rolls around, and at 9 o'clock, Angel walks in the door. And he walks like this, very slow. You can probably not hear him walk. And he has a very blank look on his face. And about 10 seconds later, his wife walks in. Similarly, I'm thinking this is a different location. She shows contagious. <laughs> What's happening? Well, she's seven and a half months pregnant. She has a reason for not walking over. So he says to me, I said, Angel. And he looked terrible. This is a guy who's a contractor. He owns his own business. He plays soccer every, every week on a, on a uh, competitive level. And, I, and he looked terrible. Angel, what's going on? I said, I think my hips is I said, no, no. What's going on? You don't look like yourself. He says, oh, this is March. He says, in January, I had a brain bleed. And I've been in the hospital for three months. He had a, he had a stroke. I said, OK. What else? He says, well, uh, while I was in, they took out my gallbladder. Because Lord knows you don't need a gallbladder if you have a stroke. So let's take that sucker out. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, and I said, well, what have you been doing? He says, I just got out last week. And, and, and again, the words just aren't coming out. I can see that he's not clear. He's not 100% there. And I think I've something on my hips. So I said, well, let's look at you. So I do a couple of things the hip, you know, we learn how to do. And, and I said, Angel, your hip is fine. I said, but this, what else is going on with you? He says, he says, I don't know. I said, well, tell me what you're feeling. He says, well, I can't think clear. The words just aren't coming out of my mouth. I said, that's clear. I can see that. What else? He says, I don't have a lot of feeling in my face. My left eye burns a lot. And there's a lot of pressure in it. I don't have any sensations in my gum. I have not had any taste for three months. I can't sleep with any he said, let's, let's check you. So I did a full neurological evaluation. I scanned him with all the things that we did, and his cervical spine and thoracic spine were trash. His EMG was just off the charts. He was terrible. I said, Angel, look, here's what we're going to do. I don't know what's wrong with your hip, but I know that your nervous system is not functioning properly, so let's work with that for now. I said, what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and check you and then adjust you, and I'm going to have you lay down for about 45 minutes, which I never do. I mean, I adjust people when they're trying to get up and go do the life. So we said, OK. So his wife had been sitting next to Trish, my office manager, and they're chatting. So I adjusted him, and I said, okay, I want you to lay down for 45 minutes. So he stayed for 45 minutes. I looked at my other, my other people. I came back to check on him. I said, Angel, tell me what you're kind of experiencing. He says, I, I, said, I don't know. I, I, I tend to think like I'm thinking more clearly. I said, well, that's good. He says, I've got this tingling in my face. I said, that's great. I said, come on, sit up. So he sat up, and he said, I, I just feel different. I said, well, I expect you to feel different. So come back tomorrow. So Tuesday he comes back, and he walks, he's got a little bit more of a bounce and stuff, but he's still not, not well by any means. And I said, so Angel, what did you experience overnight? And he said, um, I gotta tell you something. He said, this is the first night I've slept in three months. I said, that's remarkable. He said, but I also gotta tell you that I was gonna kill myself yesterday because I was in so much discomfort. I said, wait a minute. He said, that's the kind of language you're gonna use in my office. This is not my area of expertise. We need to get you to go talk to him. He said, no, he says, I'm not going to do that. He says, my wife is, I have a two and a half year old, I have a pregnant wife. I'm a man of God. I would never do that. But the thoughts came through my head because I had so much pain and I had it so desperate. I said, you promised you're not going to kill He says, I'm not going to kill him. He said, then let's go ahead and check you again today. We'll see what happens. So I adjusted him again. I had him rest again for 45 minutes. I came back to see him and I said, now what? He says, the pressure in my eye is like, it's gone. I said, good. I said, what else? He said, I, I Again, I'm thinking like I'm, I'm just, I feel like I'm thinking more clearly. Okay, good, we'll see tomorrow. So Wednesday he shows up, he's wearing a soccer short and a, and a soccer shirt, and he's got a, a bounce in his step, whereas before he was dragging. Clearly not well yet. Clearly not well. I said, now what's going on? I tasted my food for the first time in three months this week. And for him, his greatest joy was meeting his buddies and having breakfast with them before they started to work the jobs. So now he says, I can taste my food, I tasted my coffee. This is fantastic. I said, great, I'll see you on Friday. So Friday he comes in, excuse me, I get done with him on Wednesday, he walks to the front 
our front desk area, and his wife, who's sitting down in a chair next to Trish, he starts to kiss her on her face. And he goes, she says, what are you doing? He says, this is the first time in three months that I felt my lips. Hmm. And I want to kiss you. So, someone's life has changed. So I went in my office and cried like a pussy because that's what I am. Right? <laughs> I, I went and cried and I came back out. And they always want to hug me for you. We always hug our people before they go. So he waited, waited for his hug. I hugged him and he left. And Friday morning he came in and we did the same thing. And he says, I, I can't believe it. I'm thinking more clear. The pressure's gone from my eye. It still burns a little bit. Um, I have sensations in my mouth and my teeth. I'm tasting my food. So this is unbelievable. And so he's really excited. And his wife had stopped working as a clinical psychologist. She had, she had to stop working in January to take care of her husband. So she's not worked. He hasn't worked. But she says, well, because of this progress, I'm going to go back and start looking for a job. So Monday, instead of Lynn coming in and driving him, because Angel can't drive, their, their neighbor, Jose, who's 82 years old, drove him in. So Jose saw the whole process, and Jose liked it so much that he became one of our patients. So Jose now started driving into Lynn, except on Wednesday, Angel doesn't show up. And Angel hasn't missed like the last five or six appointments. He's always been on time. And so Trish and I are starting to freak out. So we call the house, there's no answer. We call Lynn, there's no answer. About 15 minutes after his appointment, in walks Angel, soaking wet on a bicycle. Jose forgot to pick him up. Angel didn't want to miss his appointment. So he rode six miles in the office. That's the dedication that he had. And he saw phenomenal results because I was grounded in what I could do. I wasn't wavered by what I saw. I knew the potential of what happened. And this was Angel 20 days after his adjustment in our office. Angel was so excited about his results that he told his wife that he wanted to become a chiropractor. So he's a long way, he's still, this is two years later, so a long ways away from being clear. He's come, he's come to the events here. He, I think he went to the wave last year. He was going to do a couple career nights. Um, he loves chiropractic. I don't know if he could do it because he still has a lot of deficiencies, but look where he's come from. And this is what we see when we're serving. And we as chiropractors are so grounded in what we do that we can take on cases like this. And by the way, when he went to go see his neurologist for a follow-up, because they said they could do nothing more for him, and when he walked in, she started to cry. And she says, what are you doing? And he said, just chiropractic. So she wants to do a case study, and he wants to co-write a case study with me of his case. Because it's fantastic. This is chiropractic. It's not Jack. This is chiropractic. This is what the body does well when it's not interfered with. So with all this great stuff that we have, all this, this the, the people that we work with, the fantastic, the fantastic profession that we're in, there's obligations. And there's admonishments. And again, when we, get, when we have the doubt, we go back to the books. And how many of you guys have seen this one, The Great Earthquake? This is a great book. This was written in 1929. It was actually revised, but the final revision was in 1929. This is BJ speaking to us about the state of the affairs back then. And guess what? It's exactly what's going on right now. <laughs> exactly. His predictions about the CCE, I mean, it's like he was here yesterday writing this stuff. You think the guy was smart? He, 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 when he passed away, he had tens of millions of dollars. You see something that you might want to look up to maybe to find out? Not because money drives it, but was he an accomplished individual? You bet he was. Had he traveled the world because of chiropractic? You bet he has. And his radio station, of course, too. But he wrote this book, and in this book he says to us that we have certain obligations. And he says, it's headed your interest at stake. And he tells us we have to do five things. Now this looks here. We've got to keep chiropractic distinct and separate. We are not a subdivision of medicine, or naturopathy, or homeopathy. We are chiropractic. And what that means is that we have a certain profession that we must remain separate and distinct. We cannot be gobbled up or included in anybody. Because what we do is different. We are a completely different profession. You've got to pick a school of support. He says it here, not me. This is BJ talking. You've got to pick a school of support. So what is that going to be for you? Is it going to be Life West? Is it going to be Palmer West? Is it going to be... <laughs> Life University is going to be sure. Whatever it is for you, whatever you feel like you resonate with, you pick a school 
when you graduate and you support it. Because if we don't replace ourselves, this what happens to the profession. It's, doing it, it's shrinking and we're shrinking. Right? Some schools, like this school in Sherman, are taking off and enrolling. But the other schools are sinking. I, I, I used to speak at Palmer West every quarter for 10 years. It's 40 times. And I was watching their enrollment go out of the left. And I've spoken to a class of seven. My study group now is a school of five. I can't imagine seven. That's, that's a, a disservice to those students because there's no camaraderie, there's no friendly competition. It's just three on to become better. But we have to pick a school. You've got to pick a school that's going to support it. You've got to join a state association. Like, this is not me speaking, this is BJ. So if you believe what BJ says to be true, then you've got to kind of do what he says, right? Because this is, we have, we're obligated to do this. So what is it going to be for you? I used to be a CCA member, California Chiropractic Association, but I, I don't have that membership anymore. I now have the Georgia Council, Chiropractic Council on Chiropractic, because their philosophy is more aligned with what mine is, which is more aligned with what BJ's was. And so I've, I've decided to join uh, Georgia. You've got to join a national, oh, sorry, a national or international association. And you've got to find a leader to support it. And again, this is not me speaking. This is right here in the book. Right? So we've got to do those things. And the other thing we have to do is we have been admonished. Who, who has seen this book, The Glory of Building? Anybody not seen it? If you haven't, it's okay. Pick it up. Okay. It's a great book. But if you look on page 252, and I think we've all seen this. You guys have heard about the sacred trust, garden, mm -hmm. sacred, that's where it came from. Okay, it's in this book. And it tells us that we have, they admonished us, he and DJ have admonished us to protect, bless you, to protect chiropractic. It's a sacred trust. We have an obligation and admonishment to do so. To keep it unadulterated and unsullied because that and unmixed. So are you a chiropractor who's going to follow the books or are you going to do your own thing? It's up to you. So one of the things that he asked you to do, how are we doing time? Oh, we'll be fine. Okay. Um, one of the things he asked us to do is to join a national or international association. Now, this, this particular day is being co-sponsored by your philosophy club and the IFCL. Who, is anybody a member here of the IFCL? Okay. Uh, and if you're not, I, I encourage you to maybe take a look at it. It's one of several organizations. It happens to be an international organization in chiropractic. Um, and what it does is we have a mission strategy and a mission, and the mission is easy. We just want to protect, promote, and advance chiropractic globally. Globally. We believe that every man, woman, and child should have the right to be checked and adjusted when necessary for subluxations because they're a detriment to life's expression. So if that resonates with you, then maybe this is something you should consider, consider doing. The strategy is to ensure it's access to for, People have a for all people at all stages of life, regardless of symptoms, because it's a non-therapeutic. Chiropractic is non-therapeutic. Our job is to analyze, detect, and correct substances when they're there. And then we want to engage in professional, legislative, and educational endeavors to support the IFCO's mission. So this is something we do. The, the IFCO was single-handedly responsible for stopping an initiative in France, where they're going to have uh, MDs could go to weekend courses and become chiropractors. They want to practice chiropractic. So we have people in France that saw this, stood up against it, and they blocked it. So we, we are international doing stuff internationally. Um, it's important to think of this as a globe and not just our community. I mean, our, our emphasis is our community, that's what we can impact directly. But we're worried about the world. Because we know that sometimes if we, if, if I happen to have uh, Nigel as a patient, and, and we clear her of her supplications, and she's a better version of herself, you think she can affect the world and impact the world a little bit better? The answer is yes. So we believe that there's like the butterfly effect. And so you want to make sure that when you see people, you're not looking at spies, you're looking at people. And people change the world, so that's what we're looking for. And our vision is that throughout all stages of life, every man, woman, child, will have to be checked regularly for people with double stations and adjust when necessary. And regularly is going to be up to you to decide as a doctor. Because everybody's different. The second thing, you've got to find some leaders. Who's heard of CWD? Chiropractic and World Domination. So, um, Lee and Schubel, Judd McGrady and I founded Schubel Visions. And our job is to empower people to become better versions of themselves through communication so that you can impact the world and make it a better place to be. Because I want my son to live in a great world. And I want your children to live in a great world. I want you to live in a great world, but I want your children to live in a great world. And I want my son's kids to live in a better world. And that can only happen if we have clear people thinking clearly. 
Because people who are not clear think unclearly. And people who aren't clear, that's how wars start. And that's how sickness in the world starts. And we don't want that for us. And so we, small, small group of people, less than 60,000 worldwide, many of whom don't think of chiropractic as what we talk about today. They think of it more of a therapy model. But if we have a small band of committed people, we can make the world a much better place to live. And that's our goal. That's CWD's goal. So if you want to learn more about it, supervisionworldwide.com. You can find out more about what we do and where we're going. We're actually expanding this next year in September, right, to San Francisco? Uh, funny, why would you ask me that? How <laughs> <laughs> funny is that? So, yes, we're going to be on this campus in October. And we would like all you guys to be here, invite all your friends. And what you will find, you will find some of the best speakers in chiropractic talking about chiropractic. And they all have different styles of doing so. And so we hope that you'll do that. Because, again, we've been admonished by BJ to do certain things. We've got to pick a school. We've got to keep this profession separate and distinct. We've got to pick a state association. You've got to pick an international association. And you've got to follow some people who can lead you. And we hope that supervision will be one of those people you'll consider leading you. Because we will not lead you astray when we get to the problem. Um, so we'll be here. The thing that's really exciting for us is that we're going to be in Barcelona next year, too. So Shubal Vision is actually going, and we've got four people registered so far. That's fantastic. It's unheard of in this world of, of um, procrastinating chiropractors. <laughs> so I encourage you, you're, you're part of a campus, a community here. You have an opportunity to make a huge impact, not only in your school, but the surrounding community and the people you come in contact with. Get grounded in your chiropractic philosophy. Know what's become, you can communicate it effectively. It's a lifelong strategy, but don't get frustrated if you don't get it right away. It takes time, and this is a great investment for your time and energy. So do it now while you still have the ability and you have mentors who are here to help you learn this thing about philosophy. And then get involved, because you've got to change the world. If you don't change the world, everything else is Mickey Mouse, as what Richard Rose said. So you have an ability to do something different. I hope you do. Thank you for your time. Join the FCL. Thank you.